Welcome to part two of the aerial terminology video of the coefficient of drag from the ultralight airplane workshop. If you have not seen part one yet, there is a link in the upper right hand corner you can click on to go see that. In part one, we talked about boundary layer and how drag is the process of transferring momentum from an object to the air when the object is moving through the air. We also talked about skin friction and coefficient of skin friction. And lastly, we talked about pressure drag. In this video, we're going to talk about the remainder of our coefficients of drag. So we'll talk about C sub D naught, C sub DS, and C sub DI. Now one form of parasitic drag that you'll see is suction drag or profile drag and there will be a coefficient of that kind of drag which has a sub CS. And you'll generally only use this with the flying surfaces such as wings and stabilizers and canards etc. Generally these suction drags or profile drags you will obtain from airfoil tables or airfoil design software and you'll get a coefficient of drag for the airfoil which is a section drag you multiply it by your dynamic pressure and your surface area in this case it is plan form surface area so the surface area you would see as you're looking from the top of the wing or from the side of the, your vertical stabilizer and rudder and you'd only count one side you wouldn't count top and bottom only the plan form which is just one side and that would roughly give you the drag for your wing Another one of our drag coefficients that deals with parasitic drag is your frontal area drag coefficient and it'll usually have a sub DO. Generally this coefficient is used for objects that are not flying surfaces. So that could be wheel pants, fuselages, sometimes cooling ducts, etc. Now in order to use this coefficient, again it's very similar to all the other coefficients. It's going to be your coefficient multiplied by Q, which I should have made a lowercase Q, and a surface area. But in this case, the surface area is not wetted area, and it's not your plan form area, it's the frontal area. So what is the area of the object as you're looking at it from the front? Now if it has kind of a rectangular frontal view, then it would just be the width as you're looking at from the front, multiplied by the height. But if it's more oval shaped like you would get with many fuselages, then you're going to have to come up with an estimate of what that frontal area is. Now there are a couple ways to come up with your C sub D O coefficient, your frontal area drag coefficient. One is to try to use an analytical method. This is pretty difficult to get a very accurate value. And you could also use software to try to estimate if you have some nice aerodynamic software. And that will also still be difficult to get an accurate value, but it's probably better than trying to use an analytical method. And another method, which still is not accurate, is to try to do it empirically. What you do is you find an airplane or shape similar to the one that you're trying to calculate the drag on and find out what its frontal area drag coefficient is and then use that for your object. You might be able to find an airplane that has a fuselage shape similar to yours, Wheel pants you can probably find uh, some aerodynamic data on and get a frontal area coefficient on that, on that and use it for your wheel pants, etc. But generally, you could find something that has a similar shape and then use its coefficient, if you can find it, for your part or your airplane. If you're an amateur airplane designer, you're frequently not going to have access to a wind tunnel so that you can do some testing of your prototype airplane to find out what the drag of it is. You also may not have access to some of the sophisticated simulation software to run a model of your airplane through to try to determine what the drag is going to be. And those frequently aren't accurate anyway. So what are you going to do? Well, one thing to do is to use a flat plate drag area of an airplane that's similar to the one that you are designing. For example, let's say you were doing a nice clean ultralight airplane and you decided maybe a 152 is going to be similar in drag profile to your airplane. Well, what you can do, go and find online what the flat plate drag area of the 152 is. 
The flat plate drag area is defined as the drag of your airplane divided by the dynamic pressure. And that comes out to be units of pounds foot square. And it basically is the drag of the airplane multiplied by some surface area value, whether that be wing surface area or frontal area. So what do we do? Well, you can usually go and look up the flat plate drag area of an equivalent airplane to the one you're designing then divide by whatever surface area you're interested in. Now, if you look in the books that are written for amateur airplane designers, they usually divide by the surface area of the wing. That will end up giving you the coefficient of drag for that particular airplane. And what you're doing is assuming that's going to be similar to the coefficient of drag for your airplane. Then what do you do? You want to figure out what the drag of your airplane is going to be, so we kind of do the reverse. So we're going to take the coefficient of drag of your airplane, multiply by the surface area of your wing, and multiply by the dynamic pressure. That'll end up giving you your drag. Again, that's only approximation. You'll probably only do that on your very preliminary design. Once you get past that and decide your design is viable, then you really should try to come up with a better estimate for your design using software or make a prototype and and have a wind tunnel. Now here's some examples of that flat plate drag area that I was talking about. For example, a Lance Air 200 around 1.6. An Euro Coupe or Cessna 150, 4.4. And that's really a pretty high flat plate drag area. But one of the things that's giving you all this drag are the landing gear sticking out in the airstream. That's really increases it quite a bit. And we got the very easy at 2.1. That should be attainable. If you remember on the very easy, the nose gear folds up, but the main gear is still out in the airstream. You would expect it to have a lower drag area than the Aero Coupe or the Cessna 150. And it's going to be very difficult to get down to the drag area of the Q2 or the Dragonfly, which have a drag area of about 1.3. Now we come to the last bit of drag that we want to talk about, and this is drag that's induced due to lift. And this is going to be lift of the main wing, lift of a canard, lift of the tail, the rudder, etc. You know, use the same mechanism for determining your lift drag for all of these. And what we're going to talk about is not an accurate drag estimation because there are factors of the lift drag that we will not really take into account. So the drag is generally going to be greater than the equation we're going to come up with. But let's talk about what the induced drag is. When you have a wing that it has an angle of attack, positive angle of attack, and this is the free stream direction here. Here's the cord. Of course, our wing is moving in this direction. Here's the angle of attack of our cord relative to the free stream of the air. There is going to be a downwash from this wing. This long arrow here represents the general direction of the downwash close to the wing. Now it changes as it goes out past the wing, but we're going to talk about close to the wing. And this downwash is one of the aspects of lift. The early aerodynamic experimenters figured out that the force on the wing caused by this downwash is at an angle and this is the, the total force in the wing due to that downwash, it is perpendicular to a line that is about roughly halfway between the cord and the free stream angle. So it's about half the angle of attack. That's called an incidence angle. And it's kind of hard to see, but that's what this square represents. So this line here is perpendicular to this incidence angle. And as I said, it's roughly half the angle of attack. Now it actually varies across span. It's going to be closer to the actual angle of attack at the root of the airplane and less closer to the free stream out toward the tip of the wing. And that's just due to the flow around the tip as you get out toward the tip. Now what the real angle is, 
summed across the wing will depend on the plan form, the airfoil, number of other factors. Well, how do we get to the drag then? Now your lift is going to be vertical portion of this force and the drag is going to be the horizontal portion of this force between this horizontal line and this force and that would give you the drag but we don't really need to do that we can come up with a approximation we don't have to measure these directly let's talk about the coefficient of induced drag that'll be a C with a sub DI for the drag induced those early aerodynamicists figured out that the coefficient of induced drag is approximated by the coefficient of lift squared divided by pi times the aspect ratio of the wing or the aspect ratio of the elevator or canard or the vertical fin. Now this is only an approximation. There are ways to actually calculate a little correction factor that would you multiply this by which would be an efficiency factor of the wing. Notice that this aspect ratio is down in the denominator of this coefficient of drag. That means the greater your aspect ratio, in other words the longer and skinnier the wing is, the lower your coefficient of drag is going to be. So lower the drag overall would be. That's why sailplanes have long narrow wings because they'll have less drag due to lift. That means planes that have short stubby wings will have a higher induced drag. There are a few things we can do to our wing to help reduce our induced drag and that's to increase our effective aspect ratio. And there's a few things we can do to do that. One would be by how we treat the wingtip, how we design the form of the wingtip. One way to do that is to have a sharp edge out on that wingtip. That's a sharp edge versus a rounded edge. If you have a big round edge out there at the wingtip, that actually causes the effective aspect ratio to reduce a little bit, to be less than what the real aspect ratio is. A sharp edge out there at the wingtip will probably at least give you the real aspect ratio. It's possible that it can give you just a little bit more aspect ratio, but not much. A winglets will actually increase your aspect ratio past what it physically is, giving you a slightly larger effective aspect ratio. These things can help reduce your coefficient of induced drag. Another thing that you can do is work with the plan form of your wing. If you can shape your wing to have an elliptical lift distribution, that should help reduce your induced drag. Now if you can't do that, it's, if it's going to make it too complicated to build, or you're having a little trouble figuring out how to get that elliptical lift distribution, another thing you can do is to make a tapered wing. That should give you a better induced drag than a rectangular wing. And if you do build a tapered wing, there's a correction factor that gets included, although I didn't put the exact correction factor here, but you can look it up in the reference I'm going to give at the last slide of, of this video. You can calculate what the induced drag is going to be if you determine that correction factor, which will be based on your taper ratio. Another thing to keep in mind is dihedral will tend to decrease your effective aspect ratio, and that will increase your drag. But if you're only going through one, two, maybe three degrees of dihedral, it's really not worth trying to think about it. It's just a tiny amount that it will reduce your aspect ratio. I kept saying I was going to give you a reference at the end of this video to learn more about drag. Here it is. This book by Horner is Fluid Dynamic Drag and it is a fantastic reference to look up drag. It'll give you more than you ever wanted to know, but it has great little tidbits. One of the things we didn't talk about is surface roughness. He'll talk about that. He'll talk about surface irregularities like having rivets in the surfaces. Uh, overlap joints and he'll give you lots of little tidbits that are interesting to help reduce drag that you may not have ever thought of. So if you get a chance to get this book or find it online I'd encourage you to go ahead and get that because it'll help you a lot in figuring out how to do drag reduction on your airplane. Well, I hope you enjoyed this little 
video on coefficient of drag and drag in general. And we'll be referencing this video in some of our UWS-1 design videos.